I'm Larry Gifford. I have Parkinson's disease. This is when life gives you Parkinson's. Joining me on this podcast journey is my wife and partner in Parkinson's, Rebecca Gifford. Hi. Hello. Today is part one of a two-part arc as we are diving deep into DBS, deep brain stimulation. Ooh. We hear from a couple of neurologists, a neurosurgeon, and two people with Parkinson's who had their DBS surgeries this year. They're friends of the podcast, Becca Miller and Heather Kennedy. Oh, you know the old idiom, it's not brain surgery? Well, I hear you say it's only radio, <laughs> it's not brain surgery. Right, well. You could say that about a lot of things. Right, yeah, sure. DBS is actually brain surgery. Oftentimes, when you're awake. Awake. <laughs> awake. Eyes wide open. Uh, National Geographic captured the lead placement surgery on video for an article from December 2016. But the audio was what caught my ear. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Moment of truth, Joel. We're going to drill a hole in your skull now. The drill is very loud. It's loud yeah. to us, but to you it's going to be super loud. Okay. okay. It will not hurt, though. Okay. All right. Here we go. Loud noise. All right, how was that? Uh, I haven't had that much fun since the last week and that. Yeah, you're a member of an elite club. Very few people can say they've had a hole drilled in their skull while they're awake. The voices you hear are neurosurgeon Dr. Kelly Foote and neurologist Dr. Michael Oaken. The two have been a team performing DBS at the University of Florida since the early 2000s. Your brain controls everything. And we can control your brain. That's part of Oaken and Foote's TEDx talk at the University of Florida. Your brain is a living supercomputer. As we learned earlier, there are a hundred billion neurons in the brain. And each one of those neurons has the capacity to fire. Uh, that is to say, to send an on signal. We call it an action potential to other neurons that it's connected to. Uh, neurons have two states, on or off. Your brain speaks a binary language just like your computer. Uh, these neurons are interconnected with living wires called axons and dendrites. And at those connections, which are called synapses, it's estimated that there are 100 trillion synapses in the human brain. So, we're up to speed. The, the neurons in the brain tend to be clustered in functional units called nuclei, and then those nuclei are wide to, wired together in functional circuits, and those functional circuits control everything you do and everything you are. Ah, there you go. Your 70 seconds of neuroscience. Are you going to quiz me? Oh, yeah. Neurons, action potentials, binary language, axons, dendrites, synapses, and nuclei. It's a spelling test. Oh, well, I'm good at spelling. Oh. <laughs> but you've got to use it in a sentence. <laughs> oh, well. There was one thing I bumped on, uh, and it was the very last thing. And those functional circuits, those functional circuits control functional everything circuits. you do, control everything you do, everything and everything you are, and everything you are, and everything you are, and everything you are. Now, I understand everything you do. Uh, thanks to Parkinson's, but uh, everything I am, everything that I am, really, this does not <laughs> resonate with me at all. Now, maybe I just want to believe that there is a mind, body, and a soul, and not just my brain as the essence of me, but the neuroscience community is uh, aligned with the thinking that you are just a brain. I bumped on that too, and I think it's because I understand where they're coming from in that the brain and the nervous system, we're learning so much about it in recent years. It has so much to do with how we react to the world. It can affect our emotions in a really big way. Our stress levels are um, an indication of how our nervous system is doing and functioning and how in balance or out of balance we are. So I understand that connection, but to say everything we are, uh, and <laughs> I don't know, but let's, maybe we should hear what some other people have to say about sure. that. Sure, yeah, what do you got? Author and professor Patricia Churchland is a philosopher at the University of California, San Diego. She focuses on the intersection of neuroscience, psychology, and philosophy. She wrote the book, Touching a Nerve, the Self as a Brain. 
In a Q&A with New Scientist, she said our hopes, loves, and very existence are just elaborate functions of a complicated mass of gray tissue. Larry, Ooh, you be New Scientist, and I will play the part of Patricia Churchland. Ooh, I get to be the interrogator. <laughs> you compare revelations in neuroscience with the discoveries that the Earth goes around the sun and that the heart is a pump. What do you think these ideas have in common? They challenge a whole framework of assumptions about the way things are. For Christians, it was very important that the earth was at the center of the universe. Similarly, many people believed that the heart was somehow what made us human. And it turned out it was just a pump made of meat. I think the same is true about realizing that when we're conscious, when we make decisions, when we go to sleep, when we get angry, when we're fearful, these are just functions of the physical brain. Coming to terms with the neural basis of who we are can be very unnerving. It can be called neuroexistentialism, which really captures the essence of it. We're not in the habit of thinking about ourselves that way. Some might say that the idea that you're just your brain makes life bleak, unforgiving, and ultimately futile. How do you respond to that? Well, new scientist interviewer, as, <laughs> as this philosopher, I would respond... It's not at all bleak. I don't see how the existence of a god or a soul confers any meaning on my life. How does that work exactly? Nobody has ever given an adequate answer. My life is meaningful because I have family, meaningful work, because I love to play, I have dogs, I love to dig in the garden. That's what makes my life meaningful, and I think that's true for most people. Now at the end of it, what's going to happen? I will die and that's it. And I like that idea in a crazy sort of way. I, this is me, Larry. Hi. Uh, we're back to Larry and Rebecca now. changed characters. Um, <laughs> I still think it's too black and white for the human experience. All those things she described. I have dogs. I love to dig in the garden. It's because I love to play. That's all your brain? I think there's got to be more to that connection. Right. Your brain helps you do all of those things. Your nervous system creates an environment. It is like the, the computer controlling this body, this vessel that we have that makes us human in a lot of ways, that gives us the full experience of being human and having a life and being connected to other people and community and learning and growing and all those things. But I believe that the body with the brain as the controller is still just a body. It's a vessel for our soul. Well, and to think of of it as everything I am makes it harder for me to want to have DBS. Right. What does that do to a person who has a brain that is not, that doesn't function quote unquote normally? Right. Right. That to say that all that you are is this brain. Damaged that, brain. Right, that doesn't produce enough dopamine. And, 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 or that you have a disability or you have a brain injury or any number of things that can occur or that you're born with in your brain. Does that I, make you less than? But I also like who I am. So do I want some neuroscientist digging around in my brain and putting leads in there and changing who I am? It's just, it seems like quite a stretch to say that our our spirits and our soul and the things that make us connected to each other and give us the possibilities of humanhood, that that comes just from the brain. Well, I think what she's saying is uh, spirit, soul, hokum. Right. <laughs> right. We die. <laughs> and that's it. Right. And she's fine with that. And that's great. And she finds a lot of peace and contentment in having her life and the things that are in her life. And that's, and that's wonderful. I, I just don't believe the same thing. I believe that we are more than our bodies. And our brains are actually part of our bodies. Yes. They are a piece of meat. Right. <laughs> Extremely complicated. And our nervous systems and all the body systems and everything, they're so complicated, but they are still just things. They're just matter. Right. Yeah. Right. It's still an organ in your body. Right. Back to the topic at hand. How are you feeling these days about brain surgery? Well, uh, you know, it's, as long as it's not everything I am. Uh, no, but it, it does ebb and flow. Like there's some days where I'm like, yep, I'm ready for it. And there's other days where I'm like, well, maybe I don't have Parkinson's. And I still have those days where I wake up and I go, I feel pretty good today. And then, you know, reality hits a half hour later. Uh, but I, um, right now, this moment, 
You know, I, um, I've been sleeping on the couch for the last month and, um, because it's more comfortable for me, it's, it's, I've, you know, been having trouble sleeping. I've been having trouble when I'm sleeping with, uh, you know, the movements where my body doesn't shut down when I'm dreaming. And I just, I, it's sleep is evasive for me. And the couch gives me, like, makes me more secure because I'm not on a higher bed and I, I feel like I have the back there to protect me. And if I fall, it's going to be like in less than a foot as opposed to like three feet from our bed. Um, and so, I mean, I still rather writhe around, but I don't wake you up, but you know, so I, I feel like it's, it's beginning to compromise our, our quality of life in a more significant way. The sleep maybe is yes. Well, and, and even just like my ability to, um, converse normally or to, um, you know, the, the, the time it takes me to do projects now, it, it, it's just, it is, I, I would like to go back five years. Think about all the things that you've experienced over the last couple of months. Mm-hmm. Are there things that DBS could, Im- could improve your quality of life regarding? Well, yeah. I mean, I still have gait issues um, and I still take a lot of medicine. Um, and so from just those two things alone and the fact that I still react to the medicine, yeah. um, you know, even though I'm taking 16 carbo levodopa a day, um, it's, um, it makes me a prime candidate for it. So I think, I, I think it could be really impactful, but it doesn't, there's no guarantee it's going to do anything for me. That's true. That's true. And that's, that's my only hesitation is that we hear enough stories and we've talked to enough people to know that it doesn't necessarily affect everyone in the great miracle positive way that it has affected some of the people that we know and some of the people we hear from all the time. Um, And so doing brain surgery and being out, you know, having to take time off from your life in a significant way for a period of time and going through all of that recovery and then the adjustments and everything that you have to do to do it to not get a big payoff. Yeah. That would, you know, that would be that would be a hesitation. I want to support you. Yeah. If you want to do it and it can improve your quality of life, 100%. I'm behind you. But that's where my hesitation comes in, where you go through all of this and then you don't you don't have the anticipated result. Yeah, I, well, yeah and it, it's the thing. Like, there's some people that get this two week bliss of like uh, like they don't have Parkinson's, and some people don't. And then some people they find their they adjust their settings a couple of times and they're ready to go. And other people it takes a year. So it, like, think about that going through the brain surgery and then not feeling the effects for a whole year. Yeah. Who. Like, it's, it's tough. That's your only reservation about DBS? Well, and of course, fearing something going horribly wrong, right? Of course. I, of course I fear that. I just, I just know that it is relatively unlikely because the people who do this are extremely experienced. And, and so right. there's, you know, there is a, a, a low chance of catastrophe, but anytime anybody drills a hole in anyone's brain, <laughs> let alone my <laughs> husband and my life partner, that makes me, just the concept of that makes me nervous. So, of course, that makes me a bit nervous. But that doesn't mean that I don't support you in that process. Should that be what we, what you choose and what we choose down the line, I support you and will do what I can 100%. I will say that there is one other hesitation because as I talk to people and as we know people who have gone through DBS and all of the kind of management involved, I'm hoping that the, the payoff and the increase in your quality of life for at least a period of time is worth the additional something to think about and manage. So you're not managing the medication, but you're still having to manage your device and mm-hmm. kind of control it and... and charge it and and all the things that you have to think about regarding this thing that is in your body permanently (laughs) right i become the bionic man um yeah and also we and we've seen evidence of this um and there's research on this too it there's a good chance it could make me an angrier person people get moodier 
Well, yes, I guess personality changes <laughs> and the risk of that. Well, if they're fooling around with everything I am, then it's <laughs> obviously going to change my personality. I hope. But here's but here's the deal. Parkinson's has already changed and shifted your personality to some degree and made you a bit more moody. So I don't know. Six of one, half dozen the other okay. for me. Because we're already kind of dealing with that, as you are, right? Because you feel it, too. I do. You notice it. Yeah. So just moodier, a little more, little more cranky, more quick, a little quicker to react to things. Mm-hmm. But maybe with the DBS and feeling more confident, more comfortable in your body will make you less reactionary. Yeah. Feeling like you can function more with a little less effort during the day. That has to improve your mood at least somewhat right well yeah i I mean like it doesn't feel like it's my body anymore and so if i could get that feeling back that i'm back in my body that would make me feel good yeah before we introduce you to our guests today rebecca and i will take the uninitiated through some dbs 101 what is it how do they do it Uh, what should you expect i'll start okay (laughs) ahead of deep brain stimulation surgery you will consult with your neurosurgeon Choose the correct device for you, and you'll be measured for headgear, which will keep your head in the same position throughout the surgery. Which is important. Yes. The actual procedure is when they drill one or two boreholes into your skull. Uh, The number of boreholes depends on if you're treating one or two sides of the brain. Are we mad scientists? Maybe. The surgeon implants electrodes at the specifically chosen spot to help your symptoms. There are two main locations for people with Parkinson's. One is referred to as STN, and the other is GPI. And the STN is capitalized, all three letters, and it is capital G, capital P, lowercase i. These targets are equally effective in improving motor symptoms of Parkinson's. The difference being STN allows for greater reduction of medication, and GPI helps to control dyskinesia and dystonia. STN stands for subthalamic nucleus. GPI is shorthand for your globus pallidus interna. People who have DBS to alleviate their essential tremor will target part of the thalamus called the ventral intermediate nucleus, or VIM. All of these targets, like the substantia nigra, are part of the basal ganglia. I love that word. Basal (laughs) ganglia. Ganglia. Uh, After implanting the leads, surgeons will snake an extension wire under the skin of the head, neck, and shoulders, where it connects with the electrode with an internal pulse generator, also referred to as an IPG. Typically, the IPG requires a second surgery. A surgeon tucks the internal pulse generator, sometimes called a brain pacemaker, under the skin of your upper chest area. This is your battery pack. Doctors downplay this chest area surgery to patients, often because, you know, it's not brain surgery. Uh, But in our conversation, Becca Miller shared her experience with the operation. So the way they do it where I am is they um, split them up into the brain part and the battery part. So first they um, do uh, put in the electrode and then supposedly two weeks later, they put in the battery pack. It's great to have something shoved into your chest. Yes, let me tell you. Unexpectedly, seriously painful. (laughs) Really? So nobody told you that it was going to be painful? Well, actually, thankfully, I talked to um, a couple people who warned me a little bit more than the doc that how painful it was going to be. And that it was more going to be more painful than the actual brain surgery, which you'd think brain surgery would be painful, but it's not as bad. Well, there are no pain receptors in the brain. True. There are in the scalp, though. Yeah. <laughs> sure. But, but yes. But yeah. when you shove a giant battery in your chest versus a thin wire, yeah. yeah. That's like... <laughs> then the IPG safely and securely connects to a remote control device. In some cases, you may even have a secure app on your phone or your iPad, which allows you to increase or decrease stimulation within a defined range of stimulation. We know DBS is used to treat Parkinson's motor symptoms like tremor, dystonia, which is when your muscles contract involuntarily causing a repetitive or twisting motion, brainykinesia, which is the slowing of your movements, rigidity or stiffness, and gait issues, which is abnormal walking. It may also positively impact non-motor symptoms of PD, including anxiety, depression, irritability, irregular sleep, loss of motivation, which is also called apathy, and the inability to experience pleasure. 
DBS is also an option to treat symptoms of epilepsy, obsessive compulsive disorder, Tourette syndrome, and more. Each of these would have different and specific targets in the brain. You, you know you're a good candidate for DBS when your PD symptoms traditionally respond positively to dopamine replacement drugs like Cinemet, Levodopa, and if your quality of life is compromised. It may be because symptoms are out of control or the amount of drugs and frequency of doses is negatively affecting your ability to enjoy life. So that is our version of DBS 101. I think it was more like a 301 course, frankly. <laughs> At the end of the second episode of this arc, we will share more benefits and risks involved in the procedure, including results of a study on long-term effects of DBS. We mentioned earlier that we know a few people that have recently gone through DBS surgery. Two of them have kindly agreed to share their stories with us. Larry and Becca Miller talked about DBS in season one and season two, and she shared her reaction when one day, about five years ago now, her neurologist suggested she consider DBS. My neurologist at the time, she was a, a, a movement disorder specialist, she brought it up in a very blasé way. She was like, oh, have you thought about DBS, you know? Um, and I really freaked out also because I had just heard from a good friend that her DBS had caused her to not be able to speak anymore, which sort of ended her working career. So I was sensitized to that. And then I also thought that it was like, at least five m more years down the road for me, somehow. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not quite sure why that was, but that it seemed like sort of, okay, well, DBS is always in the back pocket, but it's, you know, not for a while that I'll have to pull it out. Um, and so she mentioned this, and I was like, no, I haven't, I've heard of DBS, but I haven't really thought about it. She's like, oh, you could go to this support group. You know, there are people there who've had it and who are thinking about it. And I was like, I started crying and I said, please stop talking. <laughs> <laughs> I really had a very strong reaction that was just basically like, I'm not thinking about this. I, I can't, you know. And for her, it was sort of like this, you know, it was like one of many, you know, of array of treatment options. For me, it's like, oh, my gosh, this is the last stop. And like, you're offering it to me now. And this means that, you know, this indicates like somehow the progression of Parkinson's for me. And, and so it had much, much more symbolic meaning than just like, and then it's also brain surgery, you know, just that other minor point. Right. So two years later, where are you at in this process? So it, actually, when I went to WPC, um, it was very clear to me that I was both much more dyskinetic and much taking much higher doses of medication than almost everybody that I met there. Especially the people with Parkinson's. Um, <laughs> <laughs> as, as we do, oh, what are you on? What are you taking? And you're like, I'm on so much more medication than everybody. What, 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 how does that make you feel? Um, it, was, it was disturbing. I mean, I, there's somewhat of, you know, you have bragging rights. Like, oh, well, let me, let me tell you about my deposition. But that's not really like. That's cold comfort, let me tell you. <laughs> <laughs> so, and then, um, and then it was really like a, a, you know, bucket of cold water over the head. Like, oh, hello, maybe you need to start thinking about this as well as, you know, other people sort of looking at me with that question in their eyes, if not coming out of their lips, <laughs> like, Oh, so have you thought about DBS? I'm like, oh, okay, you know, maybe I should start thinking about this. And then from telling her MDS to shut up because she's not going to talk about it, <laughs> Beck began to actually get excited about the prospect of reducing her symptoms. You know, considering best outcome, it sounds absolutely delightful. Um, <laughs> just amazing. I mean, one, to have things be constant and more predictable, which it sounds like with the... Um, post-surgery that it is with the neural stimulator that you can kind of keep it more even. That's at least in my understanding. Um, and, and that you might get more sleep. Mm, I mean, sleep. I, yes, I mean, <laughs> I mean, eight and nine hours of sleep is what I sit and daydream about. <laughs> um, so that sounds just amazing. And, feels like in, in some ways, you know, in some ways it's like, oh, it's last resort. It's, you know, the last kind of 
in other ways, it feels like a reset and a, and a, and a gift of time. How are you feeling as a mom knowing you're in line for brain surgery and you have a seven-year-old daughter? Yeah, it's a little terrifying. I mean, I think that's part of it is I'm trying to get through a couple milestones and um, I'm trying to, um, you know, make some progress in my job and have that be settled before I, you know, approach the surgery, trying to have her be a little bit older and a little bit more independent um, and also just a little bit more mature potentially before I go for it and then, you know, setting up all my support. Um, you know, rallying my friends, um, having a team of supporters, like figuring out logistically how I'm going to work it. Have you talked to and, CC about this? But that, no, 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 I have not yet. No, she knows now, you. Have you she, talked to me? I've not talked to CC about it. No. <laughs> Good. Good to know. Um, have we talked to Henry? But I think we've probably mentioned that it because he's because he knows Jim yeah. Smurden. And so we talk about gym surgery uh-huh. and that, that someday I may have to have that done. Yeah. And then we caught up with Becca in November, just a few weeks after her second surgery. We asked her what the catalyst was to go for the surgery now. And it was a huge risk because I was terrified of, you know, if my daughter lost me, that she would be basically orphaned. But then um, it was worth it because I couldn't do the thing. You know, I started canceling plans all the time with people. I couldn't rely on I, I just couldn't do it. I couldn't get out. And like, and then I'd be out and then I'd be tired and there's no place to sit down and it'd just be miserable, you know? So it was like, I got to be there for her. I got to be able to do some stuff. So the, the misery quotient was way too high. And then, and then when I went in and actually talked to the neurosurgeon, I was so reassured he was just so kind and so willing to, you know, hear all my questions. And then, um, yeah. So I think those were the things that really pushed me over. What, what's one of the questions that you asked that you were looking for a specific answer to? You know, what can I expect? Like, what's the best kind of outcome? And it was going, he said, you know, people go from 30% of on time to 70% of on time. And I'm like, what? 70% on time? Woo, you got me. <laughs> you got me right there. So just imagining that was like, whoo. And that, you know, and that I, my big problem was motor fluctuations. You know, it's just like that I could go from on to off just in a in an instant. And then and then when I'm dyskinetic, it would last, it could last like three hours or something, three to four hours of just horrific, you know, writhing pain. All right, so now we've introduced Becca. Now let's hear from Heather Kennedy. This was recorded on St. Patrick's Day, March 17th, 2021. March 25th at 5.15 a.m. I will be at UCSF. How are you feeling? I'm really excited. The surgery part is no problem for me. It's the afterward, you know, that I'm concerned about where they reprogram your brain. Right. What, so what, what makes you um, nervous about that? I think having somebody literally um, controlling certain parts of your movement and your brain is, is really, I'm, I love science fiction, but this is, it, it's hard to imagine a little box where I can do party tricks. I can turn myself on or off. What's the mind movie that's playing that, that scares you about what could happen? Um, I'm a big fan of Philip K. Dick, who wrote A Scanner Darkly, the predecessor to Blade Runner, um, to Androids Dream of Electric Sheep, and Terminator. And I think probably Blade Runner, where they do the, <laughs> the tests on empathy to see who's a human being. And it, it, um, it shows that with certain types of control in the brain, we can actually change everything. Um, and so it's, it's a little scary. You really have to trust your team. When did you decide that, yeah, I think it's time for deep brain stimulation? The crippling dystonic episodes are lasting hours now instead of just 20 to 30 minutes. And I wasn't able to put on my own clothing. I wasn't able to wash myself sometimes. I wasn't able to get up the stairs. I would spend the night on the couch. And at age 50, that's just not okay. My quality of life has diminished so much in the last six months. My off times are so big now. 
And my doctor and I have tried every possible medication in, in combination with carbolovidopa and the efficacy of our drugs, you know, our medications fails. We run out of options, you know. Did you talk to others who'd had the surgery? Many. Uh, well, I spoke, I went to see Jill in Mexico, Jill Ader, um, with Alan and her sister had had it and her mother had had it. And I met her sister and we talked a lot about before and after. And she enjoys such a quality of life that she can travel. And I've spoken to Kevin Kwok and Davis Finney and a lot of people who've had tremendous results. And they told me that there's a downside. And um, they told me that there are some times when, you know, something could go wrong. So I'm going in with eyes open, hopeful that 50% of the um, problems I'm having will be sort of alleviated physically. Yeah. Like what is success? Less pain, fewer off times. I go, as you probably noticed, I go from being very manic when my meds are up to almost comatose and not able to really speak much, in which case I usually hide. <laughs> yeah. Where's the pain? Everywhere, but especially the feet, hands, neck. My neck is very painful, but the hands curl into sort of like unrecognizable claws. I'll look down at my hands and I'll say, whose hands are these? And the foot looks like a clubbed foot so that you can't possibly walk. Hmm. It's just hard. When you were diagnosed with Parkinson's, was this what you imagined? Oh, no. I thought, oh, I'll shake. <laughs> I had no, I was so cocky. Are you kidding? I used to teach classes for yoga at my local support group. And I'm sure some of the people who've had this for a long time probably wanted to, you know, punch me or something because I was so peppy. Like, you can do it. You know, stretch, pull that arm so that it's very, you know, it's straight now. You know, do try harder. And I had a talk with Jimmy Choi about this, that at a certain point, the try harder ceases to work. We have to just find adaptations. Heather has two kids that are grown, the youngest being 18. I asked, how are they reacting to the prospect of this surgery? Um, they're terrified. Well, as, as one would be. Yeah. My daughter cried when I told her. She's like, why would you do that? It sounds barbaric. Because she saw like burr holes, like the way they phrase it on the medical forms that she was looking at. She's like, they're going to drill holes in your head. I'm like, well, yeah. You know, she's, she's scared. And I think she's sort of trying to disassociate from it a little bit to survive. I'm letting her have her own path. And I've been talking to her about her life. She's going to be traveling to South America on a work study program. So I focus on what's going on for her more. Yeah. But it's hard. It's hard to balance that because you got to do what's right for you. It is. It is. And there's so much for me, there's so much shame that I can't be the kind of mom I want it to be, the consistent mom, you know, with the cupcakes ready when the kids come home. So when she was eight, how did you talk to her about it? I told her that she didn't need to be afraid, that it wasn't a death sentence, and that mommy is very strong and tenacious and never gives up. In fact, my, my family does know that I, I'm quite stubborn. So when I say I'm going to you know, do as much as I can to manage this disease and that I will be okay and that I'll always be there for you, even if I can't move as fast, that might have set her mind at ease. And teens are typically quite self-absorbed. So I try not to involve her too much. And she's not that interested in what I write or what I do. My kids never really followed me much on social media because it's too much for them. And I didn't involve them purposefully. Some people want to bring their families in. I let them choose and they chose not to be in the spotlight. So I don't speak about them a lot publicly or involve them or bring them along with occasions, even though I'm hoping that as they grow older, they'll, they'll choose to be more involved. And that way they can be, you know, the carers and the people that are around us can give a lot of information. Like your wife can, is a valuable resource to our community because she has a lot to, to share. Well, because her experience with Parkinson's is different than mine, even though right. it's the same Parkinson's that we're dealing with. Right. I'm always glad to hear when people with Parkinson's or anybody really recognizes the value of the family, the partner in Parkinson's, the care partner, the caregiver, the people around the person with Parkinson's as a resource of information about how you're doing, how what kind of needs you have, 
What's the home like? All of that information plays into how can we best treat the disease and how should we move forward and giving us opportunities to have a voice in how things go in the Parkinson's community. I'm really excited about the things that um, some of our local organizations, the BC Brain Wellness Program, are doing. Um, they just had a, we're doing several care partner focused um, series and pre- presenting content that's specific to that organ, to that community. And then I'm on the committee for World Parkinson Coalition, the World Parkinson Congress for the virtual panels, the care partner virtual panels. We are in the planning stages and getting ready to launch the third year of those panels to a tremendous response and a great desire for specific tailored content for care partners and just an opportunity to connect with other care partners and feel heard like we have something like what we have to say and what our needs are 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 significant to these organizations and to the community worldwide and to me because you know and people like me because if if we uh, ultimately lose our voice which is kind of set in the stars um, we we have people there to advocate on our behalf too and so you get to be me well and we've talked about this before at some point i may become your voice yeah although you won't be all of me because that's my brain (laughs) (laughs) we really had trouble with that yeah can't get over it (laughs) Uh, So earlier we talked to Becca about STN and GPI. So I asked Heather which target her DBS will focus on. I'm getting the globus pallidus done instead of the other. Yeah, there's STN and GPI. I'm more of a dystonic than a shaky parky. I always say, are you a shaky or a stiffy? That doesn't sound quite right. So I'm trying to figure out a new way to say that. But I'm more of stiffness, the bradykinesias, the slowness of movement. And the dystonia is quite crippling. And apparently it reacts better with the GPI. DBS was first approved for Parkinson's in 1997. It's like 25-ish years ago. Almost 25 years. Uh, but but that doesn't seem very long in the history of the 200 years of, of Parkinson's. I mean, that's a, a blink of an eye. Yes, but a lot has changed in that time. Yeah, Lots of innovation. For sure. Uh, and full disclosure, uh, my neurologist says I'm a prime candidate. And they put me in line to be evaluated by the DBS surgeon in British Columbia. So, uh, you know, we're 18 months into that queue because it's a long wait. Because you you notice I said Sir Jun. Uh, there's only one of them. In British Columbia. In British Columbia. It's a problem. We'll, we'll get it resolved. I'm on it. We'll talk about it next time. Next time on part two uh, of the When Life Gives You Parkinson's two-part deep dive into DBS. In this one, Becca and Heather check in post-op, and the results seem very different. What were you thinking? I was terrified. This is my worst, absolute worst nightmare. This is just a disaster. This is exactly what I feared. Should we control the way you feel? I knew what I should be doing. I wasn't trying to be difficult. It was like I was, it was sort of like I was frozen. Completely frozen to the floor, as if I was in some kind of quick drying cement. Maybe we are mad scientists. <laughs> it was it was actually terrifying. I couldn't roll over in bed. I couldn't manage stairs. And then I can see them getting worried and they go off to a little huddle on the side. And I'm like, I know you guys are over there talking about me. <laughs> and I'm just sitting there with my brain open. Ooh, cliffhanger. Intriguing. This is When Life Gives You Parkinson's, a Curious Cast podcast. Our story producer is Dila Velazquez, sound designed by Greg Schott. A special thanks to Heather Kennedy and Becca Miller for sharing their DBS stories, and to Dr. Oaken and Dr. Foote. The presenting partner is Parkinson Canada. Diagnosed with Parkinson's, you are not alone. Parkinson.ca. Thanks also to our promotional partners, the World Parkinson Congress 2023 in Barcelona, Spain. Make plans to be there with us. We'll be there. Go to WPC2023.org for details. The Webby Award-winning Michael J. Fox Foundation Parkinson's Podcast, hosted by Larry Gifford. Available on Apple Podcast and at MichaelJFox.org. PD Avengers. Have you signed up yet? Why not? Uh, a global alliance of people with Parkinson's, their partners and friends uniting to the cause of ending Parkinson's disease. Join us now at pdavengers.com. Spotlight YOPD, the only organization in the world with the singular focus of raising awareness of young onset Parkinson's disease. Spotlightyopd.org. 
And we would really appreciate it if you would share this podcast with someone. You know, personal recommendations are the most effective way to grow our audience and to raise awareness of Parkinson's disease. Keep positive. Keep exercising. Keep listening. We'll talk to you next time. Canada may be known for its landscapes and friendly people, but beneath the surface lies a darker side of crime, history, and the paranormal. Since 2017, the award-winning Dark Poutine podcast has explored the shadowy corners of the Great White North and beyond, delivering chilling tales from a uniquely Canadian perspective. Hosted by Mike Brown and Matthew Stockton with over 300 episodes and fresh releases every Monday, Dark Poutine is your weekly ticket to the creepier side of Canada. Listen to Dark Poutine on Apple, Spotify, Amazon Music, or wherever you get your podcasts.